sense. Okay. So I think most of us are on board. Powerful, someone else says, Ajahn. Okay, that's marvelous. I'm really glad people are enjoying it, actually. And as you say, it's very nice to hear. So, excellent. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay, okay. Shall we start? Is everyone there? I think everyone's here. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, let's start. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, or good day, as I said on here. <laughs> Well, good night or whatever it is. I don't know. I have no idea where everyone's from, but uh, nice to have you back again and able to have a bit of more dhamma uh, in our lives, which is so kind of the, the critical part, which makes life really worthwhile in an entirely different way, ordinary life. And uh, yesterday we were having a look at the uh, causes of suffering in a very deep sense. Uh, and we had a brief look at dependent origination, and then we took that back even further, even back to the very cause of delusion, of ignorance itself, which we basically uh, saw the students that the problem is a, a lack of seeing the good people, the right people, the Aryas, the noble ones, the Buddha, those who actually have seen the Dhamma for themselves. That is the kind of root problem of this whole thing. And uh, I don't know, I, I find this very interesting. Uh, and I thought maybe it would be worthwhile to look at this idea of, uh, you know, hanging out with the noble ones and associating with the good people and why it matters so much. Because I think uh, if we start to appreciate why it matters, it is more likely that we will actually apply these ideas in our life. I don't know about you, but. I, I have always been the kind of person who have always wanted to understand why things are the way they are, because that gives rise to confidence, it gives rise to a sense of faith, if you feel that they are sensible, that they actually work from your uh, perspective, yeah, your lived perspective, they actually make sense. And uh, I was always fascinated by the degree to which the Buddha emphasized the idea of uh, Kalyanamitta associating with the uh, sapurisa, sapurisa means like a superior person in a certain way, and, yeah, or a good people, and, and there's many different words that is used for these kind of people. And uh, it is fascinating, as scientists think, as initially I thought, surely the Buddha must be exaggerating. Yeah, I, I mentioned yesterday the idea where the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda that uh, uh, the whole life is uh, or hundred, spiritual companionship is a hundred percent of the holy life. A hundred percent? I used to think, surely that is an exaggeration. It can't be a hundred percent. There's many other aspects to the, you know, to the, uh, to, the to living a spiritual life that is having the right kind of friends. You know, you have to be kind, you have to be generous, you have to meditate a bit, you have to try to be wise and reflect in the right way, etc., etc. And uh, Kalanamitta is only one part of that. But uh, then you start to read suttas like the one yesterday, and you see the title starts with Kalyanamitta, with that spiritual friendship. And you understand what the Buddha means by 100%. It means 100% because without that spiritual friendship of people who see more deeply than we do, there is no beginning of the path. It doesn't even get started. Yeah, you cannot have the path at all without that spiritual friendship. And when I talk about path here, I mean, of course, the path taken all the way to the end. Yeah, that's why that spiritual friendship matters so much, because it is about the deep insights into the nature of reality. The path doesn't exist without these people, then. and because it doesn't exist without that, that's why it is a hundred percent of the spiritual life. And it becomes kind of obvious. And then you start to wonder, why is that the case? 
Yeah, and it's it's very counterintuitive for us to think that the spiritual that it, that it relies so much on external things, and it is counterintuitive because we always feel that there is a kind of solidity inside of us that is dependent of external things, and we are self guided to a to a certain degree. That's what it feels like. We feel like, yeah, I understand how things are. And you got to do the right thing. You got to live well treat other people with respect and kindness. Yeah, it kind of, yeah, it, it's obvious, yeah? And um, the reason why it feels that way, that we are, are have this thing, and this is kind of a critical issue here, is the like delusion. This is precisely the delusion of the self, yeah? The idea that we are solid in a certain way, that some of our characteristics, whatever that might be, whatever good characteristics we might have, they are solid, they remain, they stand, they are established, they cannot really be challenged by external forces. And it would be great if that was true, but it's not. You know, this, is, this is what the Buddha is saying, it's not actually the case. We can start off as a saint, and if we have the wrong conditioning on us, we can end up as some terrible person down the track. And uh, it, it is very useful in so many ways, but it shows you the, uh, the significance of the conditioning in our lives. Uh, but uh, more than that, one of the things that it does, obviously, uh, if we understand that how conditioned we are, uh, we become much, much less judgmental of other people. Uh, yeah, we have much more compassion in the world. Uh, when we see people doing terrible things in the world, like killing and stealing and, and doing all kinds of nasty things in the world, uh, then instead of denouncing these people and saying that they deserve to be put into jail and stay there for life or, or worse. And we start to understand, well, this person has just come under the wrong conditioning and this is how they ended up. And that becomes a, course, a source for compassion for the other person, it becomes a source for humility for ourselves because we understand we too might end up there. And it becomes a source for a bit of I wouldn't say fear, that's the wrong kind of word, but it's, it's, it's sort of a, um, maybe a little bit of fear even, yeah? That maybe I, I have, how careful you have to be to ensure that the conditioning on you is always right, is always coming from the right quarter, otherwise you might end up in exactly the same way. Then. And I, I think sometimes our society is so harsh. We are so harsh with people. You know, you know, you sometimes you read about people in the paper, and it's true. Sometimes people do terrible, terrible crimes. You have things like people who are pedophiles, for example. And you know, if you destroy uh, the life of a young child from the outset, and they you give them a trauma that they carry with them for the rest of their lives, then of course you have done something really terrible. Then. But again, we have to. Remember that even the worst criminals in our society would do the worst possible things. Uh, they are like that for a reason. Uh, yeah, we should never denounce anyone, absolutely. Uh, because if we do that, we are forgetting uh, that these qualities that are actually inherent in every single one of us. So hard to accept that, uh, hard to kind of <laughs> grasp that, but it is there under the surface, waiting to come out if the conditions are right. Uh, that is uh, obviously a cause for concern and a cause for ensuring that we do the right thing. So I always use the, the simile, which I thought was very useful, to think about what we are as human beings. What does it mean that we are conditioned in this way? What it means it is this uh, idea of a boat on the ocean, but it is a boat without any steering mechanism. It has no oars, there's no sail. No rudder. There's nothing like that on this boat. Also, the engine. You cannot go this way or that way. It's just a hull, just an empty hull of a boat sitting on the ocean. And of course, an empty hull of a boat sitting on the ocean is completely dependent on the external conditions, on the wind coming from the south, then you go to the north. If the current comes from the east, you go to the west. And then it is only the external conditions uh, that will decide where you go. Uh. So, uh, and we are like that. Yeah, we're drifting around like a hull on the ocean, depending on external circumstances. Uh, and don't allow the sense of self, the sense of feeling in charge uh, or feeling empowered, don't let that fool you into thinking that you are more powerful than you actually are. Uh. You are entirely dependent on these conditions. Uh. And every time you condition yourself a little bit in the right way, 
you're heading more in the right direction. So the conditioning has to keep on coming, yeah? Keep on more conditioning because every time it goes deeper. Yeah? And this is why I'm not really afraid of uh, teaching the same suttas on every retreat. Yeah, because I know I love teaching the same suttas. Yeah? Every time I hear the same similes, I think, I think they went in a slightly different way. Yeah? It goes in a little deeper. Yeah? It aids me in my practice. Yeah? So please never think of, oh no, same old sutta. Never, never think like that. Yeah? Because the moment you think like that, yeah, you're cutting off the possibility of growing with the sutta, hearing it again, adding to the understanding you had before, taking it one level further, and the potential that is always there. And in this way, gradually, gradually, you condition yourself. And in this way, the path is that conditioning, seeing the noble one, and then the thing taking off from there. So um, uh, please keep that in mind, because if you keep that in mind, it means that you will be more and take a great interest in the teachings of the Buddha. You would be more willing to understand the importance of hanging around the right kind of people. Yeah, uh, more importance of, of uh, listening. Also, you need a bit of inspiration. Choosing your friends with care. Yeah, not be afraid of saying no sometimes if a friendship is not exactly the way you thought it. Uh, should go and not kind of entirely cut people off, but it's okay to manage your life a little bit in a skillful way, otherwise it becomes problematic. And you start to understand the importance of all of these things. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the conditioning becomes even more powerful. So, um, that, yeah, and then, you know, so that is the, the foundation. And, and really what is going on there, of course, is that we are being conditioned with the right view, learning to look at the world in the right way, to see what this is all about. And then uh, the path comes as a consequence of that. But um, let us come to the uh, first sutta I was going to have a look at. Then. So we're now moving on to the ending of suffering. And uh, as we just saw that ending of suffering, it starts out with, uh, um, with Kalyanamittas, with meeting the good people, the right people. We're getting the information about the world, the understanding of the world in the right way. And once we see things in the right way, then uh, things start to take on the life of their own. Uh, yeah, if you think about it, it's, it's quite a, it's a nice way to think about this idea of right view. When you... Whatever view we have in life, that view will shape our values. Yeah, if you view the external world, what your values will be to enjoy that external world. If you, if you more, if you have, if your view is that the inner world, developing the mind is important. Well, then that you will spend time doing that. You will value the inner mind. If, you, that if your, your view is that morality matters for your happiness and the happiness of others, uh, you will value that morality and the ethics in your life. Yeah? So view and values are very closely related to each other. Uh, so the moment you have right view uh, and you have bad and wrong view, and as long as you have a view which aligns with reality, the way things are, then your values also are going to align with reality. Yeah? And then when your value is aligned with reality, then your priorities in life, uh, what is important to you, how you live, how you live, life, uh, all priorities fall in line with those values. View values, priorities, uh, yeah? And then your life starts to take a shape according to those uh, priorities that you have. Uh, and that taking shape, having priorities, and your life taking shape according to that, uh, this is a bit like Samma, Sankappa, yeah, the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, where your intention, your intentions change. Uh, yeah, your, your, your priorities are different, uh, so your intentions will change according to those priorities. Uh. So right view leads to right intention. Uh. Now you have intentions that align with the right view. Uh. You are uh, aiming for different things. Your purpose in life is, is slowly and gradually moving in a different direction. Uh. Your goal becomes something else goal which aligns with what the world actually looks like from the point of view of enlightenment. And that is, of course, what the Buddha gives us. But um, anyway, let's, uh, let's come back to this uh, idea at the very core, this, you know, hanging out with the good people who can give us that right view. And um, 
So uh, this next sutta is also from the connected discourses of the Buddha. It is also from the uh, Devata Sanyutta, the connected discourses on the uh, gods, yeah, or devatas or devas, or whatever. This is the 31st sutta, and this is precisely about the idea of uh, hanging out with the good people, yeah, associating with good people. Yeah. So let's um, uh, see what the, what the Buddha has to say here. So, uh, thus have I heard on one occasion the Buddha was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's grove, another Pindika's monastery. Yeah. Then, when the night had advanced, a number of devatas belonging to the Satulava host of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire Jeta's grove, approached the Buddha, having approached and paid homage to the Buddha and stood to one side. Yes, so this is the opening. It's a very kind of standard opening that you find in the uh, Sutras. And uh, one little point there, which I mentioned recently at the previous retreat, which is kind of nice and uh, useful to remember, is that uh, uh, in the translation here, it has another Pindika's park, is what it has here. Yeah? And in other translations, they have, it's called another Pindika's monastery. Yeah? So what is it? Is it a park or is it a monastery? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> and uh, the Pali word is arama, and the word arama means something delightful. Yeah, that's what it means. Uh, and uh, that is why it is as a park, because a park is, uh, in those days, aramas, they were kind of, uh, they were grounds, uh, yeah, a place owned by a king, where they would kind of, the kings would hang out and they would enjoy themselves. And so that basically was a little bit like a park, or maybe like a, what you call a park land, yeah, with kind of trees and grass underneath. Uh, uh, something like that, uh, but they were delightful places, uh, and these delightful places were then given as monasteries, and, and the word arama then uh, becomes the word for a monastery in the Pali Sutras. Uh, but the root meaning is something delightful, yeah, and that gives you an idea that even in the ancient times, uh, monasteries tended to be delightful places. Uh, they were not places that were super ascetic. Yeah nor were they indulgent because you retreated from the city. Instead, they were somewhere in between, but they were delightful. They were beautiful. The natural beauty was probably quite, uh, probably quite stunning, the nature, and also it was delightful in a sense of being comfortable and it could be at ease in these places. So just a reminder of that monastic life is this middle way. Yeah? It is not about harshness. It is about finding that path where the body can relax and we can be at ease in life and then you can make spiritual progress and this is also something that you find in the buddha's own biography and before he becomes a buddha uh, when he's sitting down on the bank of the famous niranjana river yeah this is uh, the buddha's biography which he tells himself in the uh, uh, like saying number 26 the arya pariyasana sutta the noble search uh, he talks about this uh, and before his awakening, he says, well, I found this uh, delightful place with a river nearby suitable for bathing, uh, yeah, a delightful grove with large trees or whatever, uh, and with a village nearby suitable for arms. Yeah, so all the kind of the requisites in life are there. It is delightful. It's a place where it's relatively easy to live the spiritual life, but still away from society. Uh, so I'm just pointing that out because all of these things kind of point a little bit to this idea of the middle way. And then we have this uh, standard kind of trope, if you like, in the suttas where you have a number of uh, devatas, uh, uh, divine beings coming to visit the Buddha, the Satullapa host um, or group. I'm not sure exactly what that is referring to. I'm sure there's something in the commentary about that, but I haven't actually looked it up, so I'm not sure. Uh, they come and they illuminate the entire Jacob's grove, uh, approaching the Buddha, the Blessed One. Uh, so, so are we supposed to believe this? And <laughs> is this true? Do devas really come and visit the Buddha? Do they come in the present day to visit teachers in the present day? Do they visit Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go there, but uh, um, <laughs> so do these things really happen? 
yeah, do they must come down and illuminate the whole Vietnamese grove? And it's a fascinating idea. Many people would dismiss this as some kind of ancient superstition. This is how they perceive the world in the old days. And of course, it's obviously not true, because if it were true, it would still happen in the present day. We have devas coming down. Where are these devas? And it was surely this is an exaggeration. This is added to these texts. Yeah? We can dismiss this out of hand. There's nothing there of truth whatsoever. You can take an arrogant tone like that and dismiss the whole thing. And then, of course, you might lose out on some of the larger picture. And one of the things that uh, I, you know, has occurred to me and I think to others as well is that, uh, is it really the case that there aren't devas in the world today? And uh, uh, sometimes they are kind of hiding in plain sight. Yeah, we may not be able to see them. I personally know people who say they have said devas, they have no doubt that they were devas at all. I know some of these people really well. I have no doubt to doubt that that is true. Um, but even more generally, beyond kind of ordinary or, or monastics or meditators seeing devas, uh, you know, one of the things that I always thought was a deva uh, is all the sightings of sightings that we have of UFOs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's one of those really strange things. Is this idea of UFOs? And I personally, I think there is obviously something to uh, UFOs, there have been so many sites saying there's been so many things taken on, you know, even filmed, and a lot of people have seen these things, and there's no way that all of these people are crazy. It's so easy to dismiss other people's ideas as crazy because they seem really out there, they seem very strange. But very often there is a deeper reality. Yeah, the world is often a mysterious and marvelous place. And what actually happens in this world, I don't think we have even touched the surface of what is happening in this world, in our modern society. There's so much that we are missing here. Yeah, so much spiritual depth, so much depth of experience even right there on the surface that we haven't really understood. And instead of thinking of UFOs as some kind of craft that comes from a planet far away, I think it is far more likely to be something much more familiar close to us yeah why would it not be a deva why would it not be a being in a parallel realm to, to us according to the buddha they exist around us yeah we should expect to see them occasionally and i think that might be it yeah they're hiding in plain sight but there because of this in our outlook we cannot see what is right there before our eyes so it's uh, i don't know I, this is just a <laughs> Pure speculation, of course. I have absolutely it's impossible to substantiate this in any way whatsoever. Or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's possible to substantiate, but I don't know how, how you would do that. But it's kind of an interesting idea. And it, uh, uh, because the world is this far more fabulous and interesting than sometimes we will uh, allow it to be. But let's leave the UFOs for now. Let's sort of throw that in there just for a bit of interest. So, uh, these UFOs, they come down, yeah, and they visit the Buddha, and the Buddha says, wow, welcome, UFOs. Uh, actually, he doesn't say that, but he, he approached the Buddha, and then they come, yeah, these are uh, beings, whatever they are, uh, and here we call them devatas, uh, and then they recite a verse uh, in the presence of the Buddha, as they often do in these particular encounters. Uh, and these verses are about the importance of good companionship. Uh, so let's see what uh, uh, they have to say. So the first deva comes down and says to the Buddha, yeah, and they are looking for embraced by the Buddha because they understand that the Buddha has deep insight. They're looking to find out whether they are right or not in their verses. So one should associate only with the good. With the good, one should be intimate. Having learned the true Dhamma of the good, one becomes better never worse. So here the good can be understood roughly to mean something like the noble ones. It is not entirely clear what it refers to, yeah? But you should hang out with the good, you should be intimate with the, with the good. In other words, you should take them as your dear friends, yeah? As your teachers even, the people you hang out with. And as you gain the Dhamma from the such people, then all of these marvelous things happen. And this sutta really is a sutta which tells us or kind of summarizes or, or expands on, I should say, really, on all the good things that happen from good friendship. Yeah, why it matters so much. 
The point is that you become better, never worse. Yeah, you become a better person by hanging around the good people. Yeah, it's obviously the case because they remind us of what is important in life. They remind us of what we should be doing and how to create happiness and suffering. They have that wisdom to understand the distinction between these things and they pass it on. And if you are a friend with these people, then it will rub it onto you. And uh, even if you don't want it, you will kind of be like uh, osmosis. It will seep through your skin or seep through your defenses and, and gradually you change. It's interesting. I, you know, I often think of myself and I, you know, sometimes I have little discussions with Ajahn Brahm and sometimes I kind of reject, what are you saying, Ajahn Brahm? I don't believe a word of what you're saying. What is that kind of, what is what you talking about? And then I often go back and I think about it. I think maybe he has a point after all. Yeah, well, I'm kind of rejecting here. Why am I rejecting this so fast? And this is kind of this osmosis process, yeah, whereby immediately we are defensive about something. We might reject something straight away. We might be skeptical about something, but it does something to you. Yeah, if you have an open mind, it kind of gradually works inside of you and it changes you without you even knowing it's happening sometimes. And one day you say exactly the same thing as Ajahn Ram said. Wait, what? Wait. <laughs> it suddenly comes out of you. Yeah, something that you didn't believe in at all before, like UFOs being daylights, for example. Yeah, I never really believed that until I thought about it. Actually, it's actually quite interesting here. Yeah? And then you start saying these things, then you realize that you have been conditioned, you have been brainwashed, and you have become more happy as a consequence. Brainwashing is great. Yeah, it makes you more happy, makes you more contented, it makes you a better person. Jeepers, who doesn't want to be brainwashed? Well, at least conditioned, let's use the word conditioned, but the same idea basically. So all of these good things, everything good comes out of hanging out with good people. Because awakening itself, but all the truly good things in life come from this. So that was the first deva. So then the second deva yeah, speaks exactly the same words. You should associate with the good, be intimate with the good, having learned their dhamma, you gain wisdom, but not from others. Yeah, you don't gain wisdom from those who are not good. Basically, that's what it means. And then uh, Wisdom is like the highest faculty of human beings. Wisdom is what makes you to navigate the world in such a way as to minimize suffering and maximize happiness. And wisdom is what leads to harmony. Wisdom is what leads to all the good things in the world. Wisdom is the highest of the spiritual faculties. So a very good reason for hanging out with the wise or the good. So again, associate with the good, be intimate with the good. Having learned the true Dhamma of the good, one does not sorrow in the midst of sorrow. Yeah, you, you, you look at the world in a different way. You think about life and death in a different way. You are not so, so concerned about death anymore. You know that death is only a state, it's only a transition in life. What really matters is the quality of how you live. Because if you live well, you're always going to go to a good destination. You're always going to be on the right path, but heading in the right direction. Death is just a blip. There's something that happens in our life. Yeah? It is not such a tragedy as sometimes we make it out. And in fact, if we use the idea of death in the right way, not only is it not a tragedy is a blessing in disguise because it's nice to change you. It's nice to make you a more spiritual person. You look at life in an entirely different thing. You understand that this short, ephemeral existence that we have as human beings, it is not really worthy of so much investment and so much worry and concern. It's the big picture that matters. It's kind of weird. Yeah, things that seem terrible for the world, if you use them in the right way, actually, they can become extraordinarily useful. Death becoming useful, it sounds like some kind of a, a masochistic sort of a fantasy dream, but not really. Yeah, there's actually a lot of truth in that. So uh, we turn around, yeah, where other people sorrow. We say, okay, maybe, you know, I, I'm just terrible to see you so sad, but look at it this way. Maybe there's an alternative we are looking at this. Yeah, maybe something good can come out of all the suffering. If you use suffering, and we shall see that shortly, maybe this afternoon, how suffering actually becomes the spur for faith and confidence, and therefore for awakening itself. The next one, 
But it is each one of these is a separate devata. Uh, again, associate with the wise, with the good, be intimate with them, and learn the Dhamma, and you shine amidst uh, your relations. It's kind of interesting, yeah, the idea that you shine amidst your relations. And it is one of the things that I found interesting with um, my own family, yeah, and what happened with my own family, which, I, which was. Uh, I, you know, when my when I went forward and became a monk, my parents were not pleased, as they say, and uh, they were actually quite upset about it because they had no idea what I was doing. So fair enough, upset. I can understand that. If you don't understand what is going on, then you are going to be upset, and that's kind of reasonable. So uh, you know, you should expect your parents to get upset when these things happen. But uh, um, uh, what I told them was that uh, remember that what matters in life is not just quantity of being together, it is the quality of the association we have. Uh, I may not be able to be with you quite as much as before, uh, but hopefully we can have more quality time together. Uh, yeah? And gradually that became clear to my parents, my brother, my, yeah, my sister. Yeah, eventually even my sister, she was the kind of the last hangout. <laughs> But uh, uh, and uh, they, they, that became clear to them. Yeah, and I, actually, we had a, a lot of very meaningful time together as my parents grew older. My, you know, before my father died, and my mother's still there on the phone. Sometimes I call her quite regularly because she's by herself now. And the, the whole thing is so much more valuable. Yeah. So shining amidst your relations, it means that you become. A, more service to your relations. You become more helpful to everyone around you, right? and especially to your relations, because your relations are so close to you. Yeah, they will always want to hear what you have to say. Right? Yeah, they will listen to you. Right? And this was, um, it's kind of astonishing how that happens. I hear, yeah, I, you know, even my father basically became almost like a Buddhist. Yeah, and it's so rare that you kind of convert your father to kind of turn around and look, look at the world in a different way. But that's what happened to me. And I realized this is the power of the Dhamma. Yeah. And if you live that Dhamma reasonably well, then, yeah, to the best of your ability, yeah, and something happens in you, yeah, then it actually has an immense effect on the world around you, especially the people who are close to you. Yeah. So very, very interesting here. Yeah. But um, um, yeah, let's leave that one for now. The next one is uh, being fair on to a good destination. Yeah, your your good rebirth depends on uh, hanging around good people. Yeah, so that you get conditioned in the right way. So the more you hang around good people, the more likely it is you will have a good rebirth. Yeah, comes in handy if the path doesn't go all the way might as well get reborn in a good destination yeah no point in being reborn in a bad place so you take that little uh, you know drop drop of honey and uh, you get uh, you know that story with the drop of honey right one of the famous Ajahn Ram stories with the in one of his books where he talks about the man who is being chased by a tiger through the jungle uh, and the tiger is getting closer and closer and closer. And just as the tiger is about to grab the man, he sees a well, he jumps into the well. And when he jumps into the well, just as he jumps into the well, he sees a snake, a big snake in the bottom of the well. So he grabs hold of the root on the side of the well. And he's there with the tiger above, the snake below. And his grip slowly kind of getting weaker and weaker, holding on to that. And as he's doing that, there's some honey dripping from a bee nest on the wall there. And the honey lands directly on his tongue. So he gets to taste that honey, yeah? <laughs> and, and that's kind of the story. The story is, well, you know, we might as well enjoy life. If there is enjoyments coming our way, yeah, we'll enjoy that. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. There's no point in kind of creating more suffering than is necessary in this world. Yeah. So if you have a good rebirth, okay, we'll take that as you, as part of the, um, uh, part of the, um, salary so to speak for your good conduct in this life and uh, then the last one is uh, based on the good being is abide comfortably yeah? uh, and this is uh, i think uh, uh, the part here is pasu vihara pasu means like uh, being comfortable and being at ease and that is a very profound word in many ways the way it is used in the suttas it means just general comfort, being at ease, yeah, not stressing yourself out in your meditation, doing the right thing. But it also, and this is an interesting thing, it refers to the deep 
ease, the deep comfort that comes in samadhi itself. Yeah, it, uh, there are all kinds of regulations in the Vinaya Pitaka, the Vinaya Pitaka being the monastic rules. And these regulations, they give special allowances to monastics who are dwelling comfortably. And that, in other words, dwelling in samadhi. Yeah, you have special privileges because uh, you are more independent when you come to that particular point. Uh, so you get uh, extra things. Uh, so samadhi and all of these things also are an outcome of hanging out with the right people. So, yeah, so this is all coming from being with good people. There's a pretty good deal, you could say, of hanging out with the right people. Um, but uh, the Buddha always takes it one step further. Yeah? These are all still what you might call ordinary. Yeah, from a Buddhist point, even ordinary is very elevated. The bar for ordinary is just really kind of high. Yeah? Ordinary is up there. It's really even the highest, some of the highest happinesses in the world are called ordinary by the Buddha. So uh, the Buddha takes it to one level higher. And this is what he says. Well, first of all, that Devata says, which one, blessed one, has spoken well? And the Buddha says, you have all spoken well in your own way, but listen to me too. One should associate only with the good. With the good, one should be intimate. Having learned the true Dhamma of the good, one is released from all suffering. Yeah. And uh, that is what the Buddhist path is all about. The yeah, release of all suffering, or you could say the attainment of the high happiness or peace and liberation and all of that, uh, all of that coming together. Yeah. And that is really the ultimate purpose of hanging out with the good people. Just as we saw in the sutta before, whereby uh, starting out by hanging out with the superior people, you hear the Dhamma going all the way to end of suffering. Yeah, through about 22 factors or links, or, or 21 links, yeah, going through all of that, and eventually leading to the end of suffering. Yeah. So that is the uh, uh, the, the uh, main, the ultimate purpose of what we're doing here. Yeah. So uh, let us have a look at one other short sutta before we uh, do some meditation together. Uh, this is a, a sutta which is like a description of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? So we have been talking about uh, hanging out with the good people. I wasn't really going to talk so much about the Noble Eightfold Path, but I thought it might be useful to have one little sutta. And this is a sutta which is a bit different from what you normally hear. But because the Noble Eightfold Path starts out with right view, and right view comes from the good people, the Kalanamitas, the areas of the world, it's kind of suitable here to talk about the Noble Eightfold Path before we go on to the other aspects of meditation, etc. So this, this particular sutta is called Nymphs, and it's found also in the Connected Discourses in the Devata Sanyutta number 46. And uh, First of all, we have a question coming from one of the devatas, then the Buddha's answer afterwards to that question. And this is what the uh, devata says. Resound, resounding with the host of nymphs, haunted by a host of demons. This grove is called deluding. How does one escape from it? So you can imagine here that this is a devata yeah, in a heavenly realm and there's all these uh, other beings around which are really attractive and you are attracted to all of these beings. Uh, it is here kind of uh, summarized as nymphs, yeah? but nymphs in this case, I think we should think of them both as male and female, depending on your, uh, on the, your own uh, inclination in this case. And, and, um, all of these attractive beings in heaven, yeah, and then you have all the scary beings, the demons here, you know, maybe the Asuras, the people who are supposed to, or the beings supposed to fight with the devas in the heavenly realms. So you have this, this attraction, and then you have the aversion or repulsion, yeah, attraction and repulsion. And this is what the world is like, yeah. So this is not just a, an expression of 
but what happens in heaven, it is also a metaphor for what happens in all our lives. Yeah? We are attracted to the nymphs of the world, the beautiful sights, the beautiful things, and we are repelled and we are averse to all the negative things that we don't like. Yeah, the whole world is like this, whether you are a deva or a human being, makes absolutely no difference. And then this deva very perceptively says that, well, this grove, yeah, this world, this whatever you call it, it is called deluding. Yeah, this, this, all these things that we fear, all of these things that we are attracted to and that we are averse to, they, they distort the mind. Yeah, they, they, we cannot see clearly because of this. Because of our attachments to these things, because of our aversion to these things, uh, we have all of this. We're not able to see things clearly. We don't have the balance in the mind uh, to be able to have that clarity, which can understand what actually is going on. Uh. And this is exactly the problem we have in our lives. Yeah, the idea of all the attachment to the sensory world, or the aversion to the negative aspects of the sensory world. Uh, all of that blocks our mind from seeing things clearly because of all the vested interest that we have, because of all the a distortion, the liking and the disliking that is always there. So how can we escape from this when we are so immersed in this? It is always around us, always there. What is the escape? It's a really nice question from this day, Matata. Yeah, it really has understood something deep about the nature of existence. So what does the Buddha say? The Buddha says this, the straight way that, that path is called and fearless is its destination. The chariot is called unrattling, fitted with wheels of Dhamma. The sense of shame is its safety rail, mindfulness its upholstery. I call the Dhamma the charioteer with right view running out in front. One who has such a vehicle, whether a woman or a man, has means of this vehicle drawn close to extinguishment or nibbana. So we're talking about a chariot or a vehicle here, yeah? And of course, this chariot or vehicle is just a, another metaphor, uh, metaphor, simile, metaphor, I don't know what it is, uh, for the uh, uh, noble eightfold path, yeah? The chariot that takes you all the way to the destination of the endless or end of suffering, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is called the straight way, yeah? Yeah, it is not the crooked way, it is the straight way. There isn't any faster way than the Noble Eightfold Path. The, the Noble Eightfold Path is, is the path. There is no other path. Buddha specifically says in the Dhammapada, this is it. You're not going to find a way which is better, which has seven factors or six factors. You're not going to find a way with ten factors. You're not going to find a better way in the Abhidhamma. You're not going to find a faster way in the Visuddhi Magga. You're not going to find a, a superior path in, in the Bodhisattva uh, ideal. And yeah, you're not going to find a tantric kind of Buddhism which is going to increase the speed of the path manifold. The history of Buddhism is the history of trying to find paths that are faster. Than, yeah, you can almost, I think it would be interesting to kind of write the history of Buddhism as a kind of uh, pursuit of a path that is better or easier or faster where you can throw out a few factors or add a few factors or change the path entirely or whatever but no let's not do that let's think of the seriously and one of the things that the buddha says in the sutta he says that what i teach you is complete there is nothing lacking in this everything is there all the factors required if you add something to what i have given you actually you are detracting something instead so the, what I've given you, everything is already there, yeah? Nor can you throw anything away. There's nothing superfluous on this path either. If you, again, if you throw something away, well, then you no longer have the path that leads to awakening. You have something else. And where does it lead? Well, it does not lead to awakening where it might lead. So we have to assume that the Buddha knew what he was talking about, yeah? And he was, you know, he had thought about this path probably more deeply than anyone in history. And that is sort of the feeling you get when you read the suttas. You feel a sense of there's an integrity to this. There's a system in this, a kind of beautiful system. One thing leading to another one. All these factors fitting together like this large jigsaw puzzle. 
it's astonishing the, the degree to which these suttas fit together, which concepts in one place matches the concept somewhere else, but in a different setting and context, and somehow it all creates this one picture called the Dhamma. There's a massive integrity, but it's interesting. It was one of the things said by uh, Professor Richard Gombrich, who Venerable Chanda knows a little bit because he lives in Oxford as well, and he used to be a professor of Sanskrit at Oxford University. And, uh, uh, he's quite well known in Buddhist circles because he's kind of semi-Buddhist. And uh, he, he used to say that the committee could, com could compose these suttas. Yeah, there's just too much integrity. And I think he was talking about the humor in the suttas. Yeah, he said that committees never, never produce anything humorous. So because the Buddha is humor, it means that this could not have been produced by a committee. I think that was one of his arguments. But I would say it's broader than that, the whole thing has so much integrity that to think it was produced by a committee does not make any sense. The Bible may have been produced by a committee, but the Bible is not is a very different kind of written work compared to the suttas. It doesn't have that cohesion uh, in anywhere near. I shouldn't say too much about the Bible, by the way, because I don't really know much about the Bible, but the little I know, it doesn't have anything of these kind of qualities. So the straight way is the noble eightfold path. That is what you have to do. And if you think that it's difficult to attain samadhi, that is not really the point. The point is, well, then you have to find a way to do it. Throwing it out is going to be self-defeating. Yeah? Or if you think it's kind of an ancient superstition from the time of India, don't think that. You might be throwing out some of the fundamental things that are important for this path to really work. So be very careful how you deal with this. Yeah? Be very, be, have an open mind. I'm not saying that you should believe things straight away. Far from it. If you take things on board just like that and you force yourself to believe things, that is almost like a self-violence in a certain way. So don't do that. But try instead to have an open mind. Yeah? Try to question your existing beliefs. Could there be something true to what the Buddha is saying here? And take this word very seriously. This is the straight way, yeah? Uh, and anything else might be a massive detour. A detour so long that you never actually reach the destination at all. Uh, so uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, then you have the idea that here that fearless is its destination. And that the Pali actually has Disa. And Disa means more like direction, yeah? So the direction of the path is fearless. That's how I would say this. I fully agree with the idea of destination here, even though both your body and the Bhante Sujato uh, render it as destination, I will take my stand against both of those. So, so that's, that takes a lot of courage, but I will do that, uh, <laughs> do that today and say it has more to do with direction. And that makes sense because a path has a direction. It has also a destination, but it also has a direction. And that direction is fearless. Everything we do of the Buddhist path, all of these things that purify us, they have a fearless aspect to them. There's nothing in those things that bring fear. In fact, what they do, they bring the exact opposite. Yeah, we start to become optimistic about the future. We start to feel that the future is bright, that we are producing a good future for ourselves right now. And when you're producing a good future, then fear and anxiety will gradually dissipate and, and no longer be relevant in your life. Yeah, so it's a fearless, fearless direction. The chariot is called unrattling or uncreaking or un, yeah, uncreaking perhaps. It is a chariot that is kind of held together. This is a, this is a path of integrity yeah, that only leads in one way only goes in one direction. There's nothing dodgy about this path. Yeah? It has a completeness, unrattlingness to it uh, if you practice it in the right way. Yeah? And it is fitted with the wheels of Dhamma. And the Dhamma here in the last line is a little bit unclear what it is supposed to mean. But uh, I say that uh, one good meaning of it here is actually wholesome qualities. Uh, yes, you're fitted with the wheels of wholesome qualities. Uh, in other words, fitted with the wheels of virtue, of kindness, of metta, of compassion, of mental good qualities, and the abandoning of the opposite qualities that are negative and bad and destructive in life. 
And you can see why that is the case, because uh, this path of Buddhism is not going to go anywhere unless you build up those good qualities. Uh, your meditation isn't going to go anywhere unless you build up those good qualities. Uh, it is specifically said in the suttas that Satipatthana practice, uh, watching the breath, is founded on two things, uh, sila and right view, sila and straight view. These are the two things. Uh, yeah? Without that uh, sila, meditation is not going to work out. Uh, so make those wheels really strong and large and powerful and have a large diameter to the wheel, the channel, small wheels go slow, large wheels go faster. Make them strong and large. Yeah, build up that seal. This is one of the most foundational things on this whole path. It's where we need to put in so much effort to be able to uh, really get this path going. Yeah. So instead of hurrying through the last two verses, because we are going to come back in a uh, two and a half hours anyway, maybe that's a good place to stop them, yeah? And then we can have a little bit more meditation practice, uh, and then we can look forward to these verses, uh, uh, every verses afterwards. So, so let's stop them and let's do some uh, meditation together uh, and uh, see what happens. So, as always, let's make sure you are not comfortable is sitting in your favorite posture whatever you like um, meditation today is going to be a little bit longer than that. But, uh, i think that's a nice idea because half an hour is quite short and it doesn't really get you going properly so let's see what we can what we can do now instead uh, Okay, so just make sure that you are comfortable, you are at ease, you are relaxing. Yeah. And uh, it is uh, interesting that the mind and the body, they are so intimately connected with each other. If you just focus on the body, just allow the body to relax. It's actually an indirect way of also relaxing the mind because they are really go together. We cannot really relax that was relaxing the other half. It is such a, a delightful thing just to uh, move inside and allow the world outside gradually to fade away. And when you close your eyes, you realize how much uh, disturbance there is just in 
and engaging with that world, just having your eyes open, uh, having your ears open, so to speak, uh, and allowing all of these things to uh, come from the outside in there. Uh, it is actually very disturbing, uh, very creating a degree of restlessness. Uh, so as soon as you close your eyes, it's um, as if the world already is just calming down. Uh, so try to notice that, try to notice every little step of peace on this path. Uh, try to notice how the uh, shutting down of the senses gradually leads to something very positive. Uh, because as you notice these things, uh, you start to understand this whole path of Buddhism, uh, what peace really means, uh, what actually real happiness is all about, uh, the nature of suffering itself. Uh, all of these things become clear as you go along in this way. Uh, but for now, just enjoy the peace. Uh,
And uh, once again, as you uh, gradually move forward in meditation practice, uh, remember to be passive. Uh, remember just to have this awareness of what is going on. Uh, there's nothing really to be done. Uh, and the less you do in the meditation, uh, the more the meditation just goes in the right direction by itself. Uh, every time we do something, we disturb the peace. Uh, Sometimes uh, all you have to do is to give the mind just a little nudge, a slight nudge in the right direction, uh, reminding yourself of the burdens of the ordinary life, uh, reminding yourself of the endless problems in the world. Uh, if you find yourself thinking about those things, uh, remember that there is no solution there. Uh, remember that the real solution is found here, in peace inside. Uh, Make the spiritual path the priority here. And the world outside is at best a support for the spiritual practice.
Okay, yeah, everyone. So coming close to the end of the meditation. And, and before we come to the end, please just take a couple of moments, uh, a few seconds, just to reflect on the progress you have made. Uh, and ask yourself if you're feeling more peaceful, at ease, uh, uh, whatever it might be, uh, and try to understand the causes, the conditions uh, that give rise to positive mental qualities. Uh. Okay, everyone, so that's uh, it for now. See you back again in a couple of hours. Uh.